Good morning, everybody, and welcome to March Pitchmasters Workshop brought to you by Next, powered by Shulman Rogers, Next Rays, and our fabulous uh, sponsors, Deloitte and Seedspot. My name is Lisa Friedlander. I'm the CRO over here at Next, powered by Shulman Rogers. Next is an award-winning uh, platform for the delivery of legal services and other value-added services to de-risk startups. Uh, we are 100% focused on startup and emerging growth companies, and Pitchmasters is just one of many things that we do on a regular basis to help support the ecosystem and help get entrepreneurs further along their journey. Uh, one event that I want to make note of, I'll add it to the chat, is our third Next Raise event. Um, ne the Next Raise platform is all about investor readiness. This will be our third in person event, and it is about connecting founders to funders. So check it out on our website, next.law, and the specific page is in the chat. Uh, we'd love for you to apply if you're actively raising a seed to Series A round please go ahead and apply. We've got about a dozen investors already participating. Thrilled to have Deloitte as a sponsor of Next Race as well. And I'm of course happy to answer any questions. So before we get started with our two wonderful entrepreneurs, I would love to give the opportunity to our sponsors to introduce themselves and their company. Um, Krista, I wanna start with you. Sure, hi, I'm Krista Smith. I'm a managing director with Deloitte's audit practice. And I lead our early stage practice here in Greater Washington. Um, so we uh, provide audit and tax services to um, high potential, fast growing companies uh, that are hopefully looking towards an IPO as their exit. Awesome. Thank you, Krista. Miranda. Hi, I'm Miranda Williamson. I'm the director of recruitment at Seedspot. We work with early stage social entrepreneurs. Um, we mostly work with underrepresented founders, getting them the support, the resources, and the opportunities they need to be successful. Awesome. Thank you, Miranda. And before everybody joined, Miranda was just giving me the good news that one of our um, participants in Pitchmasters from maybe a month or two ago um, just recently yeah. signed up for a Seed Spots uh, program and found out about it through the workshop. So that's super exciting. We love to, to see all that. Um, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, Steph, I will turn it over to you. As mentioned, we can be a little bit more flexible on time. We'll have give you specific feedback from our judges, Krista, Miranda, and myself. And then because we're a small group and we have extra time, I'll open it up to the floor to provide feedback too. Sometimes some of the best feedback you get is from your fellow entrepreneurs. So turn it over to you and share your screen and get started whenever you're ready. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, can you see my screen? We can. Wonderful. Cool. So nice to meet everyone. My name is Steph Palumbo, and I'm one of the three co-founders for Rome IO. So what we're building is a suite of tools to manage a creative freelancer's workflow. So when we say creative freelancer, we mean more digital. So photographers, graphic designers, and content creators because we found that they typically do struggle with the admin and the business side of things. So I'm going to take you into a case study of um, one of our existing um, users from our user research. Her name is Benefa. After being in business as a freelance graphic designer, she noticed that she's been undercharging 75%. And this is a common thread throughout all of our research. So, um, Again, throughout our research, we noticed that 70% of creatives regularly underprice their work. Um, and we also do know through Adobe's uh, research that creatives spend 70% of their time on the admin side of their business, not actually the creative side, which is why they got into business and also where they do excel. Uh, so again, liberating creatives from pricing confusion and admin tasks. Um, a lot of our uh, user targets are coming from graduate programs or master programs in the arts. And typically these creatives only have about one class on business and they are definitely not equipped to actually manage their business when they come out of school. So with our suite of tools in our software, we have our first one that is launching um, actually at the end of the month, which is very exciting. It's called our fee finder. And this is the first obstacles 
obstacle that creatives face is what to charge for their service. So rather than asking friends or doing Google research, we have a tool that again is called our fee finder that will generate a range of what they should charge. So we have three factors that are going into this. So the first one is crowdsource data. We have over 3,000 data points for graphic designers of what they're charging in the US. We also have AI that is able to study how big the brand is that they're working with. So think like a Nike compared to like a local mom and pop shop, coffee shop, pricing point will be different. Um, and then our third um, feature that is being considered in this fee finder um, data, excuse me, that is being considered in this fee finder is our data from MIT. So we closed a pilot partnership with MIT a couple of months ago where they released their, released their living wage index because something that we really are passionate about is that creatives get paid fairly. Again, as we saw with Benifa, she undercharges her work. Creatives very much so undercharge their work and don't feel confident in pushing for what they are, um, their value is essentially. Um, after our fee finder, we've contract templates and proposals. We also have scripts. So let's say, for example, if a creative has a client that's not paying, what email can you write that is assertive? So we provide them with these templates. Um, project tracking. So that's just a simple um, status and task list. And then our final tool, which we'll be launching, um, is our review studio. So this is just when there's feedback with a client from a creative job where in one place they can leave feedback that is easy to understand and see. Right now, the core issue is that people are leaving feedback in long email threads. It gets lost. Um, it's even shocking through partnerships at Meta that me and my colleague were working at how this still is, is, is happening in the creative world. Um, so our core pillars, get paid, stay organized, grow skills and build community. This is our founding team. We're a full female founded team, which we are very passionate and excited uh, about. Um, so a little bit about um, myself, I'll start with. So my background is in consultancy for creative companies. Um, so event design and then creative agencies. Um, I've worked a lot on the international market, being that I am half European, launching them onto the US market. Um, and I have a background as well in mental being. So I do really enjoy how creativity does support well-being. Um, and we definitely see the rise in that. So my colleague, our CTO, who's building our software is Sandy. Um, she recently was working for a UK startup, which also is a creative startup. Um, one of their first hires, she supported them in securing 35 million funding through Sequoia. And then our COO, Kim, um, has been a creative strategist at Meta for five years. We met through partnerships at Meta four years ago, and she also has her own creative agency um, that's been around for about two or three years where we continue to see these same problems that were um, persisting. So um, a little bit comparing about some of our competitors. Um, Trello, Bonsai, HoneyBook, and File Stage. So some feedback through our own um, research and then through our um, customers, future customers, is that there's a lot of bloat. There's just too much information, huge learning curve. Um, and also the biggest point is that none of these softwares integrate with one another. So I'll dive a bit deeper into some of our different factors. You can see here where we stand out. Our main big difference is our fee finder. This is no competitor or no non-direct competitor has this. Um, and then again, as I did feature like contracts and proposals are where we stand out as well. Um, a lot of customer support was one of the feedbacks um, that we received and that we are definitely looking to implement. Um, and then potentially considering a marketplace kind of similar to Fiverr and Upwork, but definitely more curated and high level. Um, this is just a bit about market um, size, not necessarily have to go into it right now, I suppose. Um, but we are looking to acquire about 5% of the U.S., which would be around 11 billion um, and global as we see there as well. So um Full product then will be all creative freelancers, which we're still doing research to see who our next um, markets would be. Um, let's see if there's anything else that I would like to share here. Um, 
Right now, actually, we are in a phase, an intentional phase of getting more people to sign up for our wait list. We're about 10 months um, old uh, as, as a business, and we've just been doing organic outreach. So we have about 300 people who are signed up for our wait list, and we're just putting together a go-to-market plan for the next month where we're going to do a bunch of outreach to have more people sign up. Um, we also are bringing on um, a set of super users for this next month as our MVP is launching to work hand in hand with a few of our interns um, to get feedback on that. Um, and to share actually a bit more about our team. So we have our three co-founders and we also have five interns and it's been really um really nice quite quite frankly we've been receiving a lot of um emails from um interns and of course we are pre-revenue so we're not able to offer um pay yet and we've had a lot of interest of of interns because they really believe in the product so right now we have three ui ux we have one um brand strategist and then we have one software engineer who's part of our team um, these are parts of some of our certs and partnerships. So my co-founder, Kim, was part of Black Ambition, and she will be part of it again this year. I was part of ICAP through George, George Mason a few months ago, um, and we we're certified women in business. And again, mentioning a partnership with MIT, which we're pretty proud about. Um, and that is it, I would say. Fantastic. Really nice presentation. Um, really great job, um, Steph. Uh, Krista, do you want to kick us off with some feedback for Steph? And Steph, if you don't mind, um, you can keep sharing in case we need reference or you can stop if it's easier to see uh, the speakers. Up to you. Yeah, it is nice to see everyone. So thank you. Um, I guess I'll start off with a question. Um, Lisa, were you timing the presentation? And if it was way long. <laughs> okay. So I, I, and so what I was waiting for was kind of um, Lisa to give you the proverbial hook so I could figure out like what you would have missed if she had cut you off. Um, I thought you did a great job of explain or defining, you know, what the problem was and, and the need and, and the use um, and also the uniqueness of your product versus competitors. I thought that was important. Um, but depending on how much time you have, some of that you're going to want to get to sooner. Um, and then there's always the question of how how are you going to make money? Now, it was on a slide because you um, it was the number of users times times the month, but maybe just to make sure that you're verbally communicating that. Um, and then again, just given how much time you're going to have to, to be more succinct, um, and not be flipping around within the presentation, but right. overall, I thought you did a great job. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks, Krista. Miranda. Okay. Um, so first off also liked the color use in your slides and I liked the design of most of your slides. I will say you used a lot of little text in some slides that I found distracting and you could just take that right on out of there. Um, the little text that we can't read does not need to be there at all. Distracting, otherwise great design. Uh, love that you're talking about creative work and it kind of reflected that in, in the creativity of the slide. I liked the start, the slide, you're gonna talk about Benefa. And then you didn't talk about her very much. <laughs> like, I wanted to hear like, what were her struggles? What was her story? I wanted more of the actual story of Benefa and what sh challenges she faced um, and how this Rome IO helped her. And then I did like how you also, I agree with Krista, you went in and talked about the value add. It, it was clear that this is a value add for creatives. And it was also clear who your customer was um, a lot of grad students coming out of college who are creatives and want to go into this industry. So a lo lot of great things going for it. Your slide cadence was a little off. Um, you would spend a lot of time on one slide and then skip over another slide. So I do agree that should be um, teased out and honed in on. I will also give you, uh, like, I think the slide with your um, team, really valuable. 
but then it seemed like you, you skipped on and then went back to your team when you were talking about the certifications. And, and so I'd say, just put those together. That way it transitions nicely from one to the next. Um, one speaking tip, you said a lot of ums that was a little distracting. Um, feel free to pause. I just, now I'm saying a lot of ums in my, my speech, it caught on. Feel free to just pause. I know it takes a while to get used to that, but pausing is a good way to catch your, catch your uh, train of thought. That's it. Thank awesome. You. Thanks, Miranda. Um, for me, Steph, I very much easily understood the problem, you know, freelancers, people working on the business versus in the business or in the business versus on the business and having these tools and all that made perfect sense to me. I would have loved to have seen this pricing mechanism. I mean, that sounded super cool. So I would have loved to have seen a little bit about how that actually works. Um, the contract templates, just be careful. I'm putting my legal hat on, you know, in terms of the DIY approach to contract templates, you got to be a little bit careful. Uh, it could be a little bit problematic. Make sure you cover that in your terms of use in terms of, People are on their own, no, you know, if they're going to be downloading these contract templates, that could potentially, you know, be an issue. Uh, the competition slide, I loved how you said the first slide, which you don't see often, which is, or what are our users saying, or what are people saying about our competitors? I thought that was really, really powerful. You don't really hear that a lot on competition slides. Your next, the real competition slide, if you will, that you do see a lot was not helpful to me. It was one of those slides that Miranda was mentioning that everything was too small. And then you had Fiverr next to Rome and Fiverr had the most checks. So to me, it looked almost identical to Rome. So if you're gonna use a slide like that, you need to maybe do less features so that it's a little bit bigger or display it differently but don't put Fiverr right next to Rome. I really loved the way that you did it in the first slide in terms of this is what they're saying about these folks. And this is, you know, and then maybe add on the other side, this is, this is how we're different. I was waiting for all the typical slides in terms of traction and business model and go to market. And then I realized that you were pre MVP and pre revenue. So bringing that up front to let people know sort of what stage you are you're about to be launching your MVP. You have 300 on the wait list. Here's your business, like all of those slides, move it up a little bit up front so that we understand exactly where you are and how you're going to get from 300 to 3000, you know, to 30,000 uh, and what that's going to look like. And then if you were raising sort of what that uh, slide on, on the raise, if you're not, you're not, that's fine. And then one other thing that is just really bugs me personally, when you're doing your TAM and SAM and SOM slide and you say, we're, all, we're looking to get 5% of the market, that's typically like a big turnoff for investors. You, it's just a cop out. Like, how are you gonna, it's not important. What, how are you gonna do it is what's more important. So what is your go-to-market strategy? What are the partnerships? What are the, uh, I, you know, I don't, how are you going to get there? Not just say we're going to get 5%, if that makes sense. Um, any questions, Steph, from the three of us before I open it up to the floor to give some feedback as well? Very clear and makes obvious sense, um, which is perhaps silly to say. Um, yeah, in terms of timing, I did find myself as well going through some slides quicker, thinking maybe not, let's not invest on this slide because it's not a pitch pitch to an investor type of thing, but absolutely agree. And I see the the point and the value in that. Um, so to what you shared, no, I don't have questions, but from like a legal point of view, I do have questions, but perhaps I should wait for that. <laughs> okay. um, everybody who's in the room, please feel free to unmute yourself, raise your hand, love to get some feedback for Steph from other folks in the room. TJ. Uh, Steph, firstly, thrilled to hear you did the ICAP just in February yes. with Karen, so that's excellent. I have three three quick things, and mostly leading off what Lisa said is uh, for the competition table. I find sometimes the four quadrant grid helps more because you 
Well, the difficult part is instead of having all those metrics, you need to choose like maybe two to four metrics, right? But it actually does the two magic things where it really gives you the differentiator and the positioning, you versus the other people and the metrics, right? The other one, and this is a little controversial, but the Tam Sam Sam slide, everyone uses it. And in reality, if you actually ask investors, they really don't care about the Tam because you're starting off and really billions and trillions just become, you know. So the what's the antidote to that is focus on the SOM. Just, and again, these are, you have to make the decisions on that. But if you focus on the SOM, you can do unit economics, build up, right? This is what one would look like. And this is how I'd get a hundred and this is how I'd get a thousand. So you would actually tackle what Lisa was saying was your starting point and your roadmap for traction in your SOM. And then a footnote to that is, by the way, the TAM is massive, right? But people only care about TAM if they first believe your starting point. Yeah. And yes, if you say TAM and 5%, that's like the kiss of death. So don't. <laughs> that's that's great yeah. feedback, TJ. Thank you. Great feedback. Anybody else have a comment or suggestion? Can I actually share, um, if we have time for it, um, what our go-to-market is specifically? Because I did go, or is it not useful for right now? Um, no, we have a few minutes. If you Great. would rather do that, then get more. Yeah, sure. Well, because I actually would enjoy hearing some feedback. Um, so our original go-to-market is through university. So again, through these art schools. Um, and then as well, I am currently having conversations with creative um, influencers, perhaps we can say, that have strong following on social media, on YouTube, and for example, offer online courses. So their users are exactly who our users will be. And we are considering bringing them on as um, partners of the company, but we're playing with how that would look um, and where it would be wise um, we even spoke about really small equity, depending on who the person is, but yeah. Equity for future team members or for, for future, for future team members. Yeah. Okay. I thought you were talking about your go-to-market strategy though. Well, yes, but one of these, um, for example, this, this, content creator who has this large following on social media we were speaking last week and we were talking perhaps um that there could be an arrangement where she is given a percentage or small um equity of of the company to also vouch for it with her existing clients through her online courses got it got it okay my general advice to entrepreneurs when they're talking about giving away equity to consultants and sort of advisors and people like that is really, really be careful and walk before you run and, you know, little, little teeny, teeny bits. If, and when you find that person has become invaluable to your company, but find other ways to work with these people before you start granting equity. And if somebody really wants to be involved in your company because they believe in it in any one of these roles and they want to see it grow and they want to see it succeed, then they're, then they'll be satisfied with that. Um, at least at the beginning, I've had a lot of entrepreneurs come to me and say, you know, I'm so-and-so advisor or so-and-so person, and they want, you know, 5% of my company. And I, I just think you have to be really, really careful and, again, like walk before you run with folks. And there's nothing wrong with obviously incentivizing and bringing everybody on the same tent and making sure, you know, missions are aligned and, and everybody wins. Uh, but right out of the gate, I, I would caution against doing something like that. If you're going to monetize it or pay somebody or incentivize, it's all new money coming in. Give the person you know, a, a percentage of revenue that they bring in for you at the outset and, and get a sense of, of how successful that person is going to be for you and how you're going to work together. Um, maybe other folks in the room have thoughts on that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other comments for Steph generally or specifically to her last question? 
Okay. Well, Steph, again, overall, great job. You know, the deck really looks great. I'm sure what you're doing, I'm not familiar in this space per se, but it sounds like it is a much needed solution. Uh, and again, the fee th piece, I think, is really interesting. And just one other point as I was thinking, as I was listening to you, in particular for female business owners, like that statistics and data show that women time and time again tend to undervalue and underprice their offerings. Uh, so depending upon your audience and what you're doing, like leaning into that and getting showing a statistic about that. I don't know if creatives tend to be more women anyway. I don't know the data on that, but I wouldn't be surprised if that was the case. So potentially a, a different angle to um, to bring up and, and lean into. Uh, but thank you so much for being here. Thank uh, you, everyone. Right. Thank you. David, we will turn the floor over to you. Feel free to share uh, whenever you're ready. Great. Well, let me start with the crucial question. Can people see the screen? We can. Looks great. great. Thank you. Great. So, um, uh, so thank you very, very much for um, giving me the opportunity to tell you a little bit more about Plain Speak Health. And apologies in advance to TJ and thanks to you. You gave me some wonderful feedback on the deck some of which I've taken and my apologies for, for the bits you'll see where I, I still went another way. Um, but the mission of Plain Speak is to make healthcare understandable for every patient. And the reason that we have this mission is because right now healthcare is not. I think we all know intuitively that doctors and patients speak basically different languages. Uh, doctors speak jargon rich um, language, are replete with terms from, from uh, other languages entirely like Latin and Greek, and patients don't understand that. That manifests in ways both great and small. If you simply ask patients what particular medical terms mean, you see that a lot of the time they simply don't understand specific terms. And this isn't just an inconvenience, it's a macro problem. There are so many statistics that one could cite, but one that I really like is that basically four out of 10 patients are unable to comprehend the directions for taking their medication. So think about all the billions of dollars that goes into finding medications and finding patients and getting the right prescription. Uh, almost half the time people don't understand that. And that uh, difficulty is not distributed evenly. People already prone to health disparities suffer more. This results in significant health problems and increased risk of death. So the proposed solutions are expensive and hard to scale, are retraining doctors or changing the curriculum of medical schools, or, and this is the reason that I got interested in this, me. Um, I served as a sort of personal translator for my parents going through cancer therapy um, and I was able to uh, translate the medical information that they were given, but uh, I'm not scalable. What's needed is an affordable, scalable, always on point of contact solution that bridges the gap between medical jargon and plain language. And with advances in AI and natural language processing, this is now possible. And that's the basic mission of Plain Speak Health, to translate from medical speak into plain speak. Let's have a look at the, the problem here. Most medical speak is using this uh, flesh Kincaid scale of, of reading ease. Most medical speak is at zero to 30, highly difficult, uh, highly complex, difficult to understand. The average American reading level is between 60 and 70 and eighth and ninth grade reading level. So a huge gap. And obviously there's variance around that, uh, that average. So the way that um, um, plain speak will make medical speak understandable is simply by translating from complex language to simpler language. Um, this is an example that I did myself, starting with an input medical text, a flesh Kincaid score of 15.8, very difficult to understand, requires someone with a specialized education. And a user can tune this to multiple different ease of reading scores, one at a high school reading level above and the other at a seventh grade reading level uh, below. And I think what you'll notice about the translation is that it makes it much more simple. It makes the language and the structure much more simple, but it retains the crucial information and it enables the patient to access that information. And of course, the output can be in whatever format an AI system can deliver. Um, American English to American English, American English to Spanish, American English to spoken Chinese, uh, and on down the line. 
So this transforms, can transform the medical experience. Communication without plain speak, your daughter is febrile and has occult bacteremia. Um, most patients won't understand that um, and don't take the right action as a result. With plain speak, you start with the same input, your daughter is febrile and has occult bacteremia, but now the plain speak system provides a simpler language alternative. Your daughter has a fever and a bacterial infection. The patient now is prompted to ask questions um, that help them understand what, what the crucial actions are. And ideally the doctor responds with a treatment plan that's comprehensible. Um, plain speak will also connect users based on similar conditions and it will connect them not based on some external feature, but rather it will connect them based on their plain language understanding of their own episode of care. And this creates not only connection among patients, um, but incredibly valuable data. So plain speak has a huge uh, public health potential, but of course it has a market potential as well. Uh, the numbers here are enormous. Uh, these are inevitably estimates. Um, but the impact of medical miscommunication is estimated to reach up to uh, a quarter of a trillion with a T dollars uh, a year. Um, this presents a number of revenue opportunities for plain speak in a number of different areas, medication adherence, clinical trial recruitment, uh, use by uh, payers and provider under licenses, uh, advertising, all of which have very significant um, price tags associated with them. Plainspeak operate, uh, occupies a unique niche. There are patient communities, there are doctor-to-doctor -doctor transcription services, patient-directed data and communication services, but nothing that, that combines elements of each and is unique. And this is one of my TJ apology slides. Um, when you look at some of the competition, um, you see that some companies have some aspects of this, but none have all of it. And even the ones which uh, partially replicate the function have raised significant amounts of money and are on track to do quite well. So where's this company? Um, well, it's in early stages. Last year was the idea, patent application. Um, this year, what I want to do is create a, a working prototype, um, and that requires what I call skill raising. Um, I have skills in health systems, which we can get into in Q&A, uh, but I need someone with technical skills so that we can actually create this, train it, and start to use it. Uh, I'd like to get a seed round funding of a million dollars to uh, develop a product and build the team uh, and do marketing outreach. So I think I'll skip my own um, background and close it there because we're closing in on the six minutes. But thank you very much. I'm, I know this is a whistle stop tour and I'd be delighted to uh, try and answer any questions you might have. Thanks. Thanks, David. Really appreciate it. Uh, nice presentation for sure. Uh, Miranda, do you want to start us off this time? Sure. Yeah. Nice presentation. And also what a um, rad solution. I log into my like medical portal on a regular basis and I'm like Googling, Googling stuff. So that brings me to my first point is um, what it, what actually, what is plain speak? Is it an app? on your phone or does it connect to doctors portals like literally what is it would love to see more focus on the like tangibles of what plain speak is um as far as like the the literal usage how do you use it and what it what is it and that would be um a key point to spend a little bit of time on my other big um piece of feedback is um, your slides weren't always explained and I wanted to read them. Like I really wanted to know what was on them. And I found myself struggling between, do I read the slides or, or, you know, do I listen uh, to David? Because both were extremely interesting, but didn't always come together and didn't, weren't always the same, especially when we had the one where it was translated, such a powerful slide to show how it was actually translated into something that you can understand. But I, I was like, oh, I'm listening to David and trying to read the slide and I was like struggling there. Um, but that, that's my main point of feedback. Otherwise, um, great cadence, uh, great solution and looking forward to seeing where you go. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Miranda. Krista. Um, so great presentation, David. Um, I thought, and I'll just kind of build on what Miranda said. Um, I think you did a great job of defining the problem um, and, and perhaps 
perhaps too much given the time um, because I clearly understood what the issue was. Um, but similar to Miranda, I didn't understand how it was going to work. Um, and so I, you know, I've used Google Translate. So would I be, you know, simply reading um, what the doctor said into your app or as Miranda said, is it going to connect and, and do the translation there? Um, and then um, since I am an accountant, I always want to know how you're going to make money. <laughs> Can I, um, because there are a couple of things raised that, um, you know, in the interest of time, I, I didn't get into as much. I can try and address both of those if if you'd like, or should I wait until further comments come in? Um, yeah, let's let, let's give the feedback first to make sure that we have enough time for all the feedback. Sure. sure. Krista, anything else? No, that was really all I had. Got it. Got it. Um, yeah, David, depending upon how much time you have, you did spend a lot of time on the problem itself. Fair enough. Um, I think just the, the couple of slides that you had with the cost of low medical literacy, the flesh Kincaid scale and the example that you gave, um, I, I think most people have been in this situation or to your point have been in this situation with their parents or with somebody else where they're explaining. I thought your example was actually a little too over the top. I personally haven't been in a room where doctors really talk that badly, um, you know, in that extreme. Maybe they're, maybe they do, maybe they don't. But I think the value is there, even if it's not sort of that extreme of an example. Um, I also was wondering. So if I'm the patient, does that mean I'm sitting in the doctor's office? with the plain speak app up on my phone and I'm literally holding it up to the doctor to speak into and then it's translating something. So the use case of it, we all, it sounds like we all were struggling with how it could be used. For me, what popped in my mind mostly, and Miranda mentioned it too, is in terms of either when you're in the medical portal or you're getting a communication from a doctor or more, especially an MRI report an x-ray report, any sort of blood report, diagnostic report, all of these reports that you get totally need translation. Um, so that to me, like that alone, if there was a plug-in overlay, you know, a pure B2B model in terms of overlaying this stuff on the doctor's communications and reporting, that to me is, you know, you're successful enough um, just with that piece. So I, I, there was... I think maybe because you're early and you're just flushing this out and you're just, you're working on the MVP, some of this stuff has not been really fine tuned yet in terms of the business model, in terms of the go-to-market strategy, who's going to be using it, who's going to be paying for it. You know, things along those lines may not be as well thought out um, or as planned out as you might have it at this point. I think you left your background out, which is at this stage, a definite no-no because the earlier you are, investors are gonna be investing in you. Yeah, they're gonna like the idea and they're gonna see that it has value and meet all those other things. But if you're not the one to execute on it, doesn't matter. So under no circumstances should you leave out who you are and why you're the person to execute on this and make this a huge business. And especially if you don't have a team and it's just you, we definitely need to know who you are and why you're going to do, you know, how you're going to succeed at this. Um, and then lastly, I think you might struggle with a million dollars right out of the gate to where you are. I don't know if you've participated in an accelerator like SeedSpot or Techstars. I mean, there or the Equitech one in Baltimore, the tech stars, this would be perfect for that in terms of what you're doing and you're focusing on some of these communities um, where the literacy rate is not as high. I think one of those programs you may be really, really beneficial for you to help you get um, all of these things sort of ironed out and maybe get a little bit of capital as well to work on the MVP. But I think you may struggle raising million dollars right out of the gate uh, for where you are. Well, huh. That's certainly true. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I would stay away from advertising models for sure. This should be subscription all the way. Um, and again, you're just going to have to decide who's going to be the paying customer here. Uh, 
So with that, Dave, if you have specific questions, David, fire away, or we can open it up to the group here. Yeah, I mean, maybe I can um, reply to some of the very thoughtful questions. Um, I did have a slide in on me. Uh, I, I very, I take your point very much that uh, over much on background or over much on uh, defining the problem, and that would have left a minute, say, for more things on the uh, on the revenue models uh, use case and myself. Um, as you probably saw, I skipped. I've sort of reinserted that slide at the beginning when you said I might have more time, and then. Uh, I, I skipped over it with the idea that we can come back to it. But but there were a couple, I, I thought, really good questions about, you know, how is this actually going to look? And then how do you make money off it? Um, I mean, one of the great virtues of not actually having a, a product is that you're free to somewhat fill in the blanks. Um, in, in an ideal state, um, this would be uh, an app that would live on your phone as well as having a, a desktop uh, equivalent. Um, and um, maximal use case would be something that you could actually bring to an encounter with a medical professional um, and under appropriate circumstances, uh, record the, the verbal interactions and use it to shed light on those. Um, it could also provide the same function to written materials, whether you get them from a lab report or, what, or whatever. And um, I'm having a meeting at some point with um, George Halverson, who used to be the CEO of Kaiser Permanente, because I, I think that one of the things that would be really useful, particularly in a closed model um, system like Kaiser, is something that sits on their um, systems and provides um, plain speak guidance for their own materials. So. Uh, you know, it's the Kaisers of the world, the Cleveland Clinics, the Mayos. Um, so that that's sort of in terms of the shape of the product, whether it's technically and culturally feasible to um, record uh, the doctor encounter is something that we'll have to test. Um, you know, getting, uh, getting an accurate uh, recording, um, having people be willing to do that, that's, that's something that, you know, is a bit TBD. But um, certainly um, the other kinds of use cases uh, are, are very, very feasible. In terms of how you make money, um, there are a couple of things. One, if this is successful in getting uh, network users, and I think there's a reasonable chance that it will be, the data itself is extremely valuable. Um, so the way that um, companies like Patients Like Me make money is that they sell de-identified um, data uh, on outcomes to payers, they sell it to pharma companies, and they sell uh, that information to uh, advertisers. Um, you may not get, well, you probably would get advertising on the site. Um, it would be health-related advertising, um, and that's such a significant part of other kinds of platforms like this that I, I, I think it's, it's worth discussing whether that's appropriate for this. But there's also huge amounts of money. So one of the slides I went through quite quickly is there's a, a $12.8 billion program um, through Medicare to uh, that, that's based on the quality of um, uh, medical care and the, the quality of outcomes. Um, and so there's a large amount of money at stake in making sure that your patients as a health system, as a payer, um, are healthy and part that has multiple factors. One of them that's a contributor is whether the patient actually understands what they're supposed to do with their medication or their, their follow-up care. Um, so a licensed service to payers or licensed service to a health system is one revenue model. Um, using the data, selling the data to um, as real-world evidence or to clinical trial recruiters is another. Using it to help drive medication adherence um, so one of the, the things that I didn't uh, discuss was fun fact about the healthcare system, uh, not so fun fact about the healthcare system. One in five first prescriptions are not filled. Um, so, you know, you do all of this work to find a patient with a disease and get them the right drug, develop the right drug, and a fifth of the time they don't take that. I'm not going to pretend that that's all due to miscommunication. There's cost, there's convenience, there's side effects, there's lots of things. But uh, so that's $100 billion a year. So, um, so some tiny fraction of that is uh, related to miscommunication. Again, that's a...
Yeah. No, I think all I think you're proving at least my point. Every you just rattled off a ton of different use cases and a ton of different revenue streams. And you don't yet know which one is going to be the secret sauce. So whether it's an accelerator, the ICAP, TJ mentioned the ICAP program that Steph went through. That I think that would also be a phenomenal opportunity for you to help narrow in. You're not going to be able to launch with all of these things. You're not going to be able to be successful at all of these things. And the data piece, yes, but that means you got to survive long enough. You got to be big enough. You got you can't launch right out of the gate saying my revenue stream is going to be the data because you won't live long enough to get to that point. Yeah. Um, I so think the I, pathway is through health systems and, and payers. Yeah, I think there's everybody I would imagine would agree that there is more than there there. Like this is a, a real problem and there's lots of different ways that you can be a part of the solution. Um, I just think the presentation gave off, you know, we didn't really get from your presentation exactly how you're going to solve this problem yet and how you're going to make money doing it. I think we all got that there is a problem. I don't think anybody would doubt that. Uh, but what we don't know is that you're the person to solve it. We don't know how you're going to solve it. And we don't know how you're going to make money solving it, <laughs> if that makes sense. Other than that, though. <laughs> Other than those things. But that's okay. That's a, Those are all, you'll, you'll get there. Um, other comments for David? Other feedback? Well, my feedback is thank you so much. This has been, I, you know, I, re, so I've done lots of different things in different fields. I mean, it, just briefly, my background is in health policy and health systems. Um, and so, uh, you know, I was trying to recognize the things I know I don't know. And there's a lot of uh, stuff in this world that I don't know. And people have been so thoughtful and generous in their feedback and in their commentary. And um, I try and come away with every single, from every single meeting with, you know, at least one, and usually exceed that, at least one really actionable, useful, thoughtful takeaway. And um, I've received many in this one, and I, I really value them. Oh, awesome. Thank you. And feel free, like both of you guys, Steph, David, both of you, we have many entrepreneurs that come back, you know, as you both get closer to launching your MVP and you're getting out there and you are starting your capital raise, um, you know, come back. We've had several entrepreneurs that that pitch multiple times. Um, at Pitch Masters. And we love seeing that. We love seeing the trajectory and the growth. Um, so with that, I guess we'll give everybody 10 minutes back in their day. Actually, uh, could, could I ask a question? Um, and I debated this. Uh, the reason that I didn't do this is that I thought that the context was so preliminary that they, having a slide like this sort of advertises, uh, no pun intended, how preliminary they are. Um, but I considered having a slide sort of saying, hey, I've had meetings with senior people at AARP, at this insurer, at this group, at this group. Is that worthwhile or does it just say, well, but have you got any revenue off them? No. Um, so it sort of advertises the absence of, of, is it a bad thing or a good thing? So I think it depends, again, if you can so if you can address the problems that we've mentioned before, yeah. Then talking about that's your traction, right? That's your pipeline. The fact that you're in having initial conversations with X, Y, and Z and they're big brands and yeah. you know, that's great. Um, but you got to solve the rest of the rest of the stuff first. Um, does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Okay. Awesome. And Ishmael, I saw... Sorry, you have to, there's two ways to register for Pitchmasters. One is to register just to attend and be in the audience like you are today and listen in and get the feedback. And then there's a separate link to apply, to actually pitch the way that David and Steph did. Um, so I'm sorry for the confusion today. We do have uh, spots open in April. It's April 17th. Um, if you'd like to go ahead and apply, I can hold a spot for you there. Um, and yes, if you give me one second, I will pull up. Yeah, I like to apply. Yeah, so I didn't, I didn't know how the, the process worked. I just had the link to attend. I thought it was the link to. Uh... Yeah, that's okay. That's okay. Um, let me add 
real quickly to the chat. Actually, maybe make this for everyone. And there is where you apply. Um, so love to have you. As I mentioned, we have a spot in April and spots thereafter. Um, thank you so much to David and Steph for joining us today and pitching your amazing solutions. Uh, we're really excited to have you both. Hope you found it useful. I will be circulating the recording, as I mentioned, so that you can watch it back and, and learn. A huge thank you to Krista from Deloitte and Miranda from Seedspot. We really appreciate you guys joining us in making Pitchmasters so successful and thrilled to have you all here. TJ, thank you again for being such a huge ally and Kent as well. I've seen you before, Paul, Constantine, some of our regulars, Tony, great to have you back, of course. And we hope you all have a great rest of your day. Thank you very much. Thank you. Take thank care, you. everyone. Bye-bye.